Good morning, Christian Church of Litchfield. Hey, we welcome you to our services today. If you're visiting with us, we're especially happy to have you with us uh, to join us in worship uh, today. Uh, not only are you joining us in worship today, I'm glad you could come today for the tomato canning party immediately following uh, uh, services today. Wow. Do you ever see so many beautiful tomatoes in your life? Uh, they were raised by Daryl Hill, I believe, and Daryl says, help yourself afterwards. So let's do it in an orderly fashion and not have a tomato throwing party, you know, and uh, uh, such. But uh, Daryl, thank you. Man, that's, that's a labor of love. And uh, that's generosity. Um, man, there's a lot there. I count it up, and I figure each of us can go home with about 10 tomatoes. Uh, that's counting men, women, and children. You know, just, just incredible. We're glad you're here today. Uh, we continue our series of messages on He Restores My Soul. From the 23rd Psalm, of course of how God, when he's the shepherd of our life, wants to restore our soul. Because life has a way of taking life out of us, doesn't it? And there are times we need to be restored. There are times we're, we're running on empty, and, and we can feel so lonely, and we can feel lost in a crowd. And today we're going to see that he wants to fill our loneliness with his presence. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'll never forget, several years ago, I heard Gene Apple speak to a group of us preachers uh, at St. Louis Christian College, and he talked about the lowest point in, in his life. It came right after one of the highest points in his life. At that time, he was uh, ministering to a church in Las Vegas that had exploded in growth. Uh, they had just dedicated a new building, and he came home one Sunday night to find that his wife had packed her bags and, and was leaving uh, him for a man that she had worked with. He was devastated. They tried to go to counseling, tried to work it out. It just didn't work out. After that, he talked about the following Christmas Eve, short time later. He said, you know, they had several services, and he spoke at the last service, and then he was in a hurry to get all of his bags packed and get ready to fly back home to Illinois to his family, and, uh, which he would be with on Christmas morning. But he said, time we got done with Christmas Eve, and I left the church, and all. He says, it was, it was about 9, 10 o'clock at night. And I hadn't eaten, and I thought, I need to get a bite to eat. He said, Las Vegas, the city that never sleeps, was sound asleep. Everything was closed on Christmas Eve. He found nothing open until he went to Sam's Town, and it was open. And it was actually pretty, pretty busy. And he went to like a 50s diner there, and he sat down alone, and he said, I was, I, I, I was beginning to be really depressed. And I felt so lonely. He said, I had just spoken to over 2,000 people that evening about Christmas and about Emmanuel, God with us. And here I am having a pity party because I am struggling with, with loneliness. And he said, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, he said, the jukebox began to play Elvis, Are You Lonesome Tonight? And he said, I just kind of did a number on me at that point. And <clears throat> he says, I thought, Gene, you are so blessed. You have more close friends than anybody deserves. And you're going home tomorrow, fly home to 20 members of your family that love you care deeply about you, support you, and you're going to spend Christmas with them for a few days. And he said, then he looked around, and he saw there were a lot of people sitting there alone. And he says, I thought, they don't have anybody in their life. And he said, that day I began to have a new empathy. 
for people struggling with loneliness. A century ago, only 6% of the households in America consisted of a person living alone. That number has just risen dramatically. In fact, there are more, if you count the single households, as well as people living alone, there are more of them than married couples with, with children in America. The numbers are just, just staggering. When we see a society in which we are surrounded by people, but so many of them struggle with loneliness. We're going to look today uh, at how God wants to come into our life and walk with us through life. Put his arms around us. And that's why I love this picture. Man, that, that sheep, the shepherd holding it right against his chest, his arms around it. Man, you think that sheep looks lonely? No way. And that's where God wants us to be in our relationship with him. He wants to hold us close to his heart, filled with his love for us. Here we look at today, Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, and of course the older translations say the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's the promise that I want you to begin to live out in your life beginning today. No matter what you're going through. Maybe you don't struggle with loneliness. Hopefully you don't. But most likely you will at some point. And it's imperative today that we lay hold of a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with God our Father. We're going to today break it down in three basic categories. First off, we want to look at that no one is exempt from loneliness. You may not be lonely now, maybe you've never been lonely in your life, but things happen, life happens. And you can wake up one day and you can think, why, why am I feeling so down? And it may be because you're struggling with loneliness for the first, first time. We're going to look at a couple of great men of God that at times struggled with loneliness. First is David in Psalm, uh, another Psalm we're going to look at here, Psalm 25. Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. That was written by David as well as Psalm 23. Though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. He writes here, for I'm alone and I'm in deep distress. And so for David, a man after God's own heart, and an incredible man of, of faith, and uh, just great men of God in the Old Testament, he, he struggled with it. Perhaps an even more surprising example is that of the Apostle Paul. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, these verses. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Everybody's just, it seems like, leaving. Let's read on. Only Luke is with me. I have to laugh when I read that. If you're Luke, what do you say? Thanks. Thanks. I'm glad I'm really helping out. I don't have anybody, just Luke, you know. It's like when the kids call, hey, Mom, what's happening? You got any company? Nope, just Steve. You know, just Steve's with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. No one is exempt from loneliness. It, if it can hit a man, a giant like David, and it hit one like the Apostle Paul, it'll probably hit you or I at some point too. It's the one sitting in a prison cell. It's the soldier sitting in a barrack thousands of miles away from home. 
It's the recently divorced man sitting alone in an unfurnished apartment. It's the wife who has just buried her husband. It's the missionary on foreign soil. It's the stroke victim in a nursing home. It's the parents whose arms ache for their child that has just been taken. It's the young boy who sits by himself and eats lunch alone in the school cafeteria every day. It's the teenage girl that sits at home on prom night. Loneliness. It's the phone that doesn't ring. It's the empty mailbox. It's the forgotten birthday, the broken promise, and the invitation that was never extended. It's a fresh grave. Loneliness is that feeling, nobody cares about me. Nobody knows me. Nobody understands me. Nobody loves me. Vern Gosden sang years ago, you don't know about lonely until it's chiseled in stone. This will date me. How many of you remember this song? One is the loneliest number. Anybody remember that song? It came out in 1969. Yeah, as a junior in high school. 1969. You remember who sang one is the loneliest number? I'm not going to sing it for you. Aren't you glad? But <laughs> any of you remember? Oh, yeah. Three Dog Night, yeah, the hounds, yeah, sang it, didn't they? Three Dog Night, yeah, one is the loneliest number. Man, those are some really high-class songs when I was growing up, you know. Uh, I remember when I was a teenager talking to a, a kid that I, had, I just had acquaintance with. And I could tell right away that this, this, this young person wasn't, wasn't happy. And, and we just got talking, and I said, if you could have anything in, in, in life, what would it be? And she said, just for one person to love me. She says, I think then I would find happiness for the first time in my life. And she was serious. Uh, no one is exempt from loneliness. They can hit all of us. Now, secondly, let's, let's quickly move on, and let's break it down in some categories. We're going to look at factors that can trigger loneliness. First off, of course, are, are circumstances. Circumstances can, can trigger loneliness. Uh, I think we have a scripture on this one, don't we? Psalm 102, yeah, here we are. For my days disappear now, as we read this, boy, this, this, this guy's really hurting. Now, we don't think it's David, could be, but don't think it was written by David, this song. For my days disappear like smoke. My, burn, my bones burn like red hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass. I have lost my appetite. Because of my groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. Wow, doesn't that do a number on you when you, when you look, at, look at that? I think we've got some more. Yeah, six and seven. I am like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely as a solitary bird on the roof. Now, you may say, wow, am I glad I came today? I'm feeling better by the moment, you know. Man... Let me ask you, don't you have 
some compassion for, for what this guy's going through? I do. Maybe, hopefully, none of us have ever been that low. I bet some of you have. And the psalmist is really struggling. Why does God put that in there? Why put this psalm in there? Because to encourage, to, for us to, to relate to and say, that's my life. I'm not alone in this. And to find the solution in a faith in God and a relationship with God as our shepherd of our life that the psalmist finds to drive us to God. Uh, even in those darkest uh, circumstances. And circumstances, if you look at David and Paul that we've been looking at, they were both in confining situations. David had a very confining job as a shepherd growing up, taking care of his father's sheep. There was just a few sheep, so he probably didn't have any other shepherds with him because there was that many. And he never talks about other people. So he was alone with the sheep. He didn't punch a time clock and say, hey, it's, I'll do the 9 to 5 thing. It was 7.30 to 3.30 or whatever it is. Uh, he says, hey, I'm with the sheep day and night. He's with them out there all by himself. Had to be, had to be lonely at times. But he used that confining circumstance to shape his relationship with God and to write, Psalms from that loneliness. The Lord is my shepherd. The sheep don't have to worry. I'm watching over them. I'm right here with them. Nothing's going to harm them. I'm going to protect them. God's with me. And, and in those situations, maybe you'll feel the presence of God like you've never experienced it before or could elsewise. We see that with the Apostle Paul. Uh, in, in his circumstances, when he writes 2 Timothy chapter 4 that we looked at, he was in prison. Now, he wasn't in solitary confinement, but nevertheless, he was confined. He couldn't go out and go on missionary journeys. He couldn't go and live life like he would like. He couldn't go on vacation and say, hey, I want to go see some sights. I want to go visit some friends. Uh, it was a very confining thing. And so anytime you're confined, whether it be a, a hospital bed whether it be a dorm room or a military barracks or a room in a nursing home. I read this week, 70%, 70%, seven out of 10 of the people in convalescent homes never get one visit from anyone. Talk about forgotten people. Talk about people that must struggle with Loneliness, confining circumstances can certainly trigger it. But we're going to look at a second factor here that I think is, is age. Age. Now, the Apostle Paul is near the end of his life. When he writes 2 Timothy 4, those are probably some of the last words he'll write. It's the last letter he would write. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. This was the last. And he feels that his uh, death is near. You know, earlier in that chapter, he says, I fought a good fight, finished the course, I've kept the faith. You know, henceforth there's later for me a crown of righteousness. So, so he's, he's getting up there. His health has been, always been great. And the older you get, it's, it's easy to struggle with, with, with loneliness. Um... And if you have parents that are aging or grandparents, you, you need to be sensitive to them. I think a lot of it is, is just a fact of getting older. I don't think it's intentional. Sometimes their personality is not even the same. My mom was a social person. She loved people, and you who knew her knew, knew that very, very well. I would call her every day. Sometimes I wouldn't get her called uh, uh, at night, and I'd call her, and I'd say, Mom, how are you doing? Oh, uh, been lonely today. Haven't heard from anybody. I go, really? I said, I can't believe that my two sisters, Judy and Sandy, didn't call. Didn't they call you? Well, no, well, yeah. Well, Sandy called a couple times, but she didn't talk that long. And Judy did call, too, you know. 
I said, well, I thought you were going to go with Tony today to town to eat lunch. Well, yeah, we did go eat lunch, but you know. And I said, well, I thought you said John and Charlotte were over last night to see you. They were coming. Didn't they come? Well, yeah, they came, you know. And uh, I said, Mom, you got more friends than anybody should have, you know. And, uh, but was my mom a complainer? No. It's just where she was. And I, I tell our kids, I said, see what you got to look forward to. <laughs> You think I'm a pain now? You ain't seen nothing. <laughs> it's just going to get worse. You know, so, so understand that. Understand that. And uh, uh, sometimes you just can't, can't help it. Thirdly is, is people. People. Paul wrote about Demas forsaking him. Just left him because he loved this world. Here was a co-worker. In other writings, Paul talked about what a great man of faith Demas was. How that he was a great servant of the Lord. How that he'd worked alongside Paul. And now he's abandoned ship. He's gone spiritually AWOL. And uh, anytime you feel deserted by those you believed in, trust in, that you thought was a close friend, and they just abandon you, they betray you, they stab you in the back, uh, they gossip behind you, um, Man, that, that can trigger loneliness and do a real, real uh, number on you. So those are some factors, but what time is remaining. Let's look at uh, number three. Let's look at some of the steps to heal the loneliness. Number one, take care of yourself. When you're struggling with loneliness, it's, it's usually associated with its first cousin, depression, you know, and, and, and you begin to just go on feelings. I don't feel like getting out of bed. I don't feel like cleaning the house. I don't feel like going out to eat. I don't feel like eating anything. And, and you just go from bad to worse. Take care of yourself physically. Eat right. Exercise. Uh, I've always found I have the best frame of mind uh, in situations and circumstances when I walk regularly. In fact, I was telling our dog this week, I says, we are both so out of shape, in such bad shape, we are going to start walking tomorrow. We're going to start walking those creek bottoms. And she looks up at me like, you got to be kidding. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, physically, Take care of yourself. Force yourself to do some things, and it will help. Mentally, mentally, feed your mind. Uh, read a good book. Don't just watch TV. That can depress you even more so and make you feel worse. Get a, get a good book and, 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 and read. I remember going to a convention several years ago and heard a guy say, you can walk into a preacher's office and look at his library and tell when his mind died by the books he has on the shelf. I went out and bought a bunch of new books. You know, never read them, but boy, they sure look good on the shelf. You know, They're all different colors and they just blended in real well. Thirdly, spiritually, spiritually, take care of yourself spiritually. Now we're going to go back to the Apostle Paul and see how he did all of these that I'm asking you to do. Paul is a great example. I think we've got some scripture here. Ah, oh, great. 2 Timothy 4.13. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Winter's coming. And he says, hey, you know, I, I need my coat. My, you know, I didn't have time to get it. They didn't let me, let me get it. Whatever reason, we don't know. But bring the cloak. You know, I'm going to need it to keep warm, take care of myself physically. I left with Carpus and Troas and my scrolls. I want to do some reading. Maybe uh, things he wrote, maybe there's things other people wrote. We don't know, but especially the parchments. And the parchments were those that were on, it'd be like really expensive documents, really priceless documents. And this, of course, refers to God's word. So Paul was doing what I'm asking you to do. Take care of yourself physically, mentally, and spiritually. 
Now, I think we read on uh, in, the, in the next verse. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. Wow. Here was a time where he struggled with loneliness. No one, everyone deserted him. May it not be counted against them. Now we read on. I think verse 17 says, but, and here's the answer. The Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. He said, my faith wasn't only in people. When they deserted me and left me and disappointed me, it only enhanced my relationship with the Lord. He always shows up. He never abandons us. He stood with me. He gave me strength to do the task before me. When I thought, man, hardest thing for him to do, keep on preaching. But the God gave him the strength to do that. And he says, and he rescued me from, from certain, certain death. So that's one thing we, we need to do is we need to take care of ourselves. And that sounds selfish, but you got to do that if you're going to have uh, anything to give besides running on the empty tank uh, to be restored, uh, you really need to do that. Now, secondly, we go on and we look at reach out to someone, and we're going to break it down to two areas. We're going to say, let's reach out to someone for friendship. And the second one we're going to be, we're not there yet, we'll get to it at the end, is to help somebody. But first of all, let's look at this one, okay? Reach out to someone for friendship. If you're struggling with loneliness, you just need to reach out to someone. Try to befriend somebody. And um, I'm going to give you some principles on that because there are some people that have an obscene number of friends. You know, they just, they're just, and there are other people that don't seem to have any. And is it a matter of luck? I don't think so. I think a lot of it is, is how we relate to people. And so I'm going to give you four key principles that will enhance strong relationships for you, for our friendship. Here we go. Take the initiative. Don't just sit back and say, that church is unfriendly. Nobody spoke to me. You be the one and say, hey, glad to see you. Glad you're here. My name is Steve. What's your name? Take the initiative. You write that note of encouragement to somebody you know that is hurting and is also struggling. You make that hospital visit to somebody you know that is sick. You take the initiative and take that first step. That, that's just so important. Secondly, next, examine your attitude. Examine your attitude. Don't be negative. And don't put everybody in the same category as one bad experience or one bad relationship. You know, if you say, well, everybody treats me badly, poorly. Everybody is mean to me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. They always forget me and leave me out. Minerva Myers call those words toxic. They destroy relationships. And uh, examine your attitude. Don't be like grandpa who fell asleep and the kids decided to put some Limburger cheese on his mustache. <laughs> and he woke up a little bit later, took a sniff and he says, this room stinks. And he got up and went to his bedroom and he says, my bedroom stinks. And he walked into the kitchen, took another sniff and says, this kitchen stinks. And he went outside and took a sniff of fresh air and he says, the whole world stinks. You know, um, there's just some people like that. They're just negative. There's, they just, you know, let me tell you, that's toxic. People have enough problems now, if they hear those negative tones, you might as well scream fire in a crowded theater because people are going to 
run for the exits as fast as they possibly can, you know. Examine your attitude. Maybe part of it's my attitude more than the other person. Thirdly, this is a good, be unselfish. Be respectful of the other person. Prance above everything else, be respectful of their time. That's one of the great ways of being unselfish. When you say, hey, um, do you have five minutes? Tell your story in five minutes or less. Don't take 50 minutes when you say, I just need five minutes. You'll always have a lot more friends the shorter you keep your conversations. People just don't have time for you to go on like the never-ending story. Be unselfish and don't try to upstage the other person's story. When they're pouring out your heart, their heart to you, don't say, oh, yeah, by the way, let me, uh, let me tell you something that really happened to me that make you feel a whole lot better because yours is nothing compared to what I'm about to tell you how bad I've had it. They'll say, no thanks. I'm out of here. Adios. Goodbye. Elvis has left the building. Thank you and good night. You know, be unselfish. And number four, this is an important one. Be patient. Don't be pushy. There are some people that just try to crowd and smother relationships and, and uh, they, you know, want to do everything with their best friend now that they've just discovered and, well, let's go eat out tonight, let's go to the ball game tomorrow, let's give them some space, give them some time, be patient, you know. Um, I know a singles minister that said, uh, works with singles, and he said one night they were having a social hour and uh, uh, there was uh, 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 two or three new people there and they asked to introduce themselves and, and they did and the last one to, to introduce himself was a guy and he says, hey, he says, I'm here, he says, I'm looking for a wife. If you're interested, see me afterwards. He says, afterwards, it's as if he had the plague, you know, boom, there was nobody within a country mile of this guy, you know, be patient, don't be pushy. Man, if you can do these, you, you're going to have more friends than you can count, uh, more friends than you're going to have time for. If, if you'll just, instead of saying, well, they didn't. They didn't remember my birthday. You remember theirs. You know why? I bet they'll remember yours next year or the year after that or three or four. I bet they will in time. And if they don't, so what? It's a birthday. Big deal. 100, 100 years from now, won't really be that important, will it? So take the initiative. Examine your attitude. Be unselfish. Make it more about the other person. And they'll say, wow, this, this person really cares about me. He's interested in me. And um, be, be patient. Now, second area I want you to reach out to someone is reach out to someone to, to help. These are the best friendships is when you, you see a need and, 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 and you just respond. How many of you remember the first Rocky movie? Remember Rocky? He was a nobody, you know, and uh, he went to the pet store to try and get some food for his uh, pet turtle, you know, and there he meets Adrian. Remember when he first meets Adrian? She is so shy and insecure, she can't even look him, you know, in the, in the eye because she's been abused by her, her uncle and such, and... Uh, She's very plain, very unattractive, and, and he, Rocky reaches out to her, you know, and um, he, uh, he befriends her. And uh, he doesn't look to date the homecoming queen or Miss America. Uh, he just needs a friend, and, and he tries to befriend her. And she became a real companion to him. And guess what, three, four movies later, she became pretty attractive, too, didn't she? Yeah, she uh, uh, did one of those makeovers, you know. Uh, but it began with somebody saying, hey, I'm just here to help you. I just need a friend. I'm reaching out to you. Uh, our son Mark, as you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago was rollerblading and uh, had an accident out 
uh, from the parking lot of the road that comes down to the parsonage from the church and uh, broke his leg in two places. And he knew it was broke uh, immediately. He, he heard it. You know, it was a twisted fracture, one of them. And, and he's got a plate and rods and screws and everything in it and uh, pretty messed up. But when he went down, uh, he said, Dad, what was interesting was there was a AA group uh, meeting at our church. And he said, they were just letting out. And I'm lying there. He was doing a rollerblading with his daughter. And she ran into the house to, to get help. First thing he told her to do was, he says, Olivia, take off your rollerblades and run to the house. Not with your rollerblades. Take them off and then go get help. And uh, he said of the AA group, one car after another came and every one of them stopped. He got out and said, hey, can we help you? you? He says, no, I, I'm going to have to have an ambulance, I think. I, I think it's broken pretty badly. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm okay if I just lay here. Okay, if you're sure, can we do anything for your daughter? She was there. Uh, no, no. Nope. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. He said, everybody stopped. He said, everybody, but, but then there was a couple that walk every evening. They walk right down through the, the lane there that goes to the church, past the parsonage. Mark says, I see them every evening, always speak to them. He said they've asked the church if they could use tables and chairs at times to borrow. And he said, we've always let them use whatever they need and never charge them anything. Sure, glad to help you out, whatever. And he said, we've always tried to befriend them. He says, right after it happened, they were some of the first ones to walk up there. And I thought, they're going to come running to help. They saw him, they got pretty close, and then they turned and walked off. He and his daughter there the only time, at that time walked away. And he said, you know, I thought, it's pretty amazing. Did they feel uncomfortable? Did they know I'd get involved? They couldn't miss what had happened. <laughs> they, they could see, uh, you know, it was really a bad situation. And uh, Lisa, you say, you okay? Or are you just taking a nap down there, you know? But, uh, <laughs> you, you know, nothing. It's just like, we're going to avoid this one altogether. I guess my point is this. You and I have that choice, don't we? It almost reminds me of a story Jesus told, doesn't it? Of the Good Samaritan, where... Here's a guy that's really hurting. I think I'll pass by on the other side. You have that option. But it almost invariably triggers and produces incredible loneliness. The people that are so fulfilled and so happy and satisfied with life and their relationships are those who take time to come over and kneel down and say, let me help you. Let me pray with you. Let me call the ambulance. Let me go get your wife. Let me do whatever is necessary. Those are the people that have an incredible amount of friends. And those are the people that always feel the Lord's presence even when their friends aren't around. Because they're doing what God's called them to, to do. That's why I want to ask of, uh, 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 of you. Jesus said, if you s seek to save your life, and it's all about me and my happiness and people meeting my needs, he said, you're going to come up empty. You're going to lose your life. But whoever will give up his life and invest it for my sake and the kingdom's sake, he'll find true life. And in the end, he'll receive eternal life a hundredfold over. Wow. What an offer. But the choice is ours as to how we're going to respond. There are other people hurting a lot more than, than you may be hurting, a lot more lonely than, than, than you are. They need you to come alongside them. You can do that with the spirit of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, with, with the love of God. And that's what we're going to ask you to do. We're coming to our invitation time where we're going to stand and sing our invitation hymn. And it's an invitation for you to come follow Jesus. And uh, he is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And 
God has promised. He's our refuge and strength, ever-present help in time of trouble. He never walks out when everybody else does. He's always there. And he reaches out to you, but will you take the initiative and accept him and his son Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't done it, we encourage you to do it as we stand and sing.